Okay, let's talk about blood. We've talked about the pump of the cardiovascular system, which is the heart, the blood vessels, which are the conduits that allow blood to be distributed throughout the whole body, perfusing the body with oxygen, nutrients, hormones, among other things. I just read in a textbook that blood is not part of the cardiovascular system. I find that an intriguing statement. I think the suggestion is that the term blood is not incorporated within the moniker or description of the system, which is cardiovascular, cardio referring to the heart, vascular referring to the blood vessels. But I think it would also be silly to suggest that blood is not part of the cardiovascular system. If it's not part of the cardiovascular system, I don't know what system they would put it in. Certainly, it partakes in the endocrine system because it helps transport hormones. It's part of the immune system because it helps transport leukocytes, white blood cells, which are the hallmark of the immune system. But I would say, without a doubt, blood is part of the cardiovascular system. The heart is the pump. Arteries, veins, venules, and capillaries are the pipes or conduits through which blood travels. So 70%, upwards of 70% of our body is composed of water. And certainly that's also the case for blood. And it's how things get transported from point A to point B in our body. And it's a great mechanism to transport things because like we have suggested, diffusion has a very limited distance that it can transport things. That is to say, diffusion can only transport substances, molecules, or ions a very, 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 very short distance. So blood is a great medium to allow things to be transported, not all things want to be transported directly in the blood plasma because most of it is water. Some things have a characteristic known as hydrophobic, meaning they fear or don't like to be around water. But there are mechanisms such as plasma proteins within the plasma that act as transporters for molecules that are characterized as being hydrophobic. So let's take a closer look at blood. So once again, we've talked briefly about the role of blood. One is transport. So we're talking about transport of gases. So gases are oxygen and carbon dioxide. So blood, along certainly with the pressure gradients created by the left ventricle of the heart, blood is distributing oxygen throughout the whole body. And certainly along with those conduits, we talked about the arteries, arterioles, meta-arterioles, capillaries. Transport of oxygen throughout the body and certainly transport of carbon dioxide away from those cells back to the heart and back to the lungs so we can breathe off that CO2. So transport of oxygen to the tissues, to the cells, and transport of CO2 away from the tissue and cells. Blood is also transporting nutrients, hormones. So we'll talk about all of these things that are being transported. It's a huge part of the function of blood. Protection. Blood plays a, a large part in partaking in the immune system. It circulates leukocytes, otherwise known as white blood cells, which are part of our immune system that we'll talk about in detail in a subsequent video. And regulation. Blood regulates body temperature, and it also regulates fluid volume within the body, within the extracellular fluid. And by correlation, the intracellular fluid as well. So when we take in fluid water into our body, it's going to immediately move into our bloodstream and be distributed throughout the whole body. Please keep in mind that blood is part of the extracellular fluid. I should say blood plasma is part of the extracellular fluid. Extracellular fluid is composed of this blood plasma and the interstitial fluid versus intracellular fluid is confined within the plasma membrane of cells. 
So one thing that is lost on a lot of us, or at least we forget, is that blood is a form of connective tissue. And this seems what somewhat counterintuitive because it's not a typical tissue. It's a fluid tissue, if you will. And because it is a tissue, it's composed of two broad things, cells and an extracellular matrix. And we've discussed when we talked about different types of tissue that they are all composed of cells and an extracellular matrix. So the cells of blood are known as formed elements, and they include the red blood cells, which are known as erythrocytes, white blood cells, which are known as leukocytes, and platelets. Erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets make up the formed elements. Now I have cells here, but officially only one of those three formed elements is a true cell, and those are the leukocytes, otherwise known as white blood cells. Red blood cells, the erythrocytes, are not true cells because they lack a nucleus, they lack mitochondria, and they're non-mitotic. So we'll just discuss the red blood cells in more detail, but they are not really true cells. Platelets are fragmentary cells, so those are not true cells. So that's why we have this term formed elements to describe the collection of these three types of blood cells. I put cells in quotes because once again, it's probably not totally accurate to call them cells, but still everyone does. I shouldn't say everyone. Books still refer to erythrocytes as red blood cells. So please keep that in mind. So the extracellular matrix of blood is the blood plasma. And the makeup of blood is best seen in this test tube to the right. If you put blood in a test tube, put it in a centrifuge, spin it, this, the red blood cells are going to fall to the bottom of the test tube and the plasma towards the top. So what this is showing is hematocrit, which is the percentage of red blood cells that make up the blood. Generally, it's about 45%. That's highly variable between the sexes, females, have a lower percentage or a lower hematocrit than males. But generally, hematocrit is around 45%. And once again, hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells within the blood. The other roughly 55% is the blood plasma. And less than 1% is made up by the white blood cells and platelets. And that's what's known as the Buffy coat. So that blood plasma is composed of water, plasma proteins, hormones, solutes. So we'll discuss that also in better detail in this video. Okay, well, let's take uh, that close look at plasma right now. The great majority, upwards of 92% of the plasma is composed of H2O. That's at least 92% based on weight, there are hormones floating through the blood. And like we discussed, the endocrine system utilizes the bloodstream to transport hormones long distances throughout the whole body. Keep in mind, neurotransmitters are not transported via the blood, unless, of course, we're talking about neurohormones. But neurotransmitters travel a very, 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 very short distance. As a result, they don't utilize the cardiovascular system or the bloodstream to go from point A to point B. But all other classic hormones are dropping into the bloodstream to be distributed throughout the whole body. Waste products such as urea, uric acid, and bilirubin are transported through the blood. Urea is a breakdown product of amino acids. Bilirubin is the result of breakdown of red blood cells. Uric acid is the product of the metabolism of purines in the body. So there's a number of other waste products, including those that are transported through the blood until they get to the destination where they will, will be eliminated from the body. Once again, gases, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. And plasma proteins play a very large part within the blood plasma. And there are a number of different plasma proteins in the body, in the blood. 
such as albumins. Albumins are a class of plasma proteins that have a variety of functions. One is transport. So I suggested that hydrophobic substances, and this pertains to lipids and fats, don't want to be in direct contact with H2O. As a result, they require some sort of transport mechanism to get them through the blood plasma from point A to point B, and plasma, pl plasma proteins play a huge role in this. Plasma proteins also help buffer pH. pH is the measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration in solution or in the body, and that needs to be tightly regulated. So a buffer is going to help prevent any drastic changes in pH throughout the body. Blood viscosity, that is the thickness of the blood, is dictated by these plasma proteins. And related to that is osmolarity. And that's just the concentration of different molecules or ions within the blood. And of course, nutrients. Glucose is a huge nutrient. So we're talking about carbohydrates, amino acids, fats being distributed throughout the whole body. So let's just take amino acids, for example, which are the building block of proteins. We do consume in our diet proteins, but we don't use those proteins directly to rebuild things in our body. What happens is the proteins are broken down into, the, into their building blocks, which are amino acids. The amino acids get distributed via the bloodstream throughout the body, and then our cells can reconstitute those amino acids to make a plethora of different plasma proteins needed in the body. I want to go back to plasma proteins because I realize I failed to talk about some other types of plasma proteins, one of which are gamma globulins, otherwise known as antibodies, which are part of our immune system. They travel through the bloodstream, surveilling the blood for any foreign antigens. And then we also have some what are known as inactive plasma proteins, such as fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a precursor for a protein known as fibrin. And fibrin aids in forming blood clots anytime there is any sort of hemorrhage, whether it's an external hemorrhage or internal hemorrhage. And fibrin is needed to form that blood clot. But keep in mind, we only want blood clots existing when we need to stop some sort of bleed from a blood vessel. If there is no hemorrhage, we don't want any blood clots clots occurring. That's why it's important to have that inactive precursor of fibrin, which is known as fibrinogen. And this is a common theme within plasma proteins. There are a number of different types of inactive precursors or inactive plasma proteins that when activated will turn into the other form of that protein. Okay, so now let's talk about red blood cells, otherwise known as erythrocytes. We'll have another video specific to white blood cells, otherwise known as leukocytes, and another one for platelets. Erythrocytes are biconcave cells that you can see over here on the right, shaped somewhat like a donut, with the exception that the hole does not proceed all the way through the red blood cells. So there's an indentation within the red blood cell. And that is really just allowing for greater surface area for the red blood cell, which is advantageous because the goal of the red blood cell, once again, is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. And the more surface area there is for a red blood cell, the greater opportunity there is for exchange of gases. Once again, a red blood cell is anucleated, meaning it does not have a nucleus, so it does not have genetic material. It does not have a mitochondria to make ATP. Mitochondria is another organelle in the body that contains a small amount of genetic material. So there are no membrane-bound organelles in red blood cells. They are non-mitotic, so they are not going to reproduce themselves via the process of mitosis. The lifespan of red blood cells is about 120 days. 
And that's quite long considering the lifespan for the other two formed elements, the white blood cells and platelets, are about seven to 10 days. So after 120 days, the erythrocytes tend to be recycled in the spleen. They become trapped in the spleen, broken down. And then throughout this process, more red blood cells are being created. The process of creating more red blood cells is known as erythropoiesis. And that is activated by the hormone known as erythropoietin, also known as EPO, which is a term you may have heard with endurance athletes that take synthetic EPO to help their bodies increase their red blood cell count. Why would an endurance athlete want to increase their red blood cell count? It's so they can deliver more oxygen to their tissues The more oxygen means more ATP for their muscles to work and hopefully result in better performance in any endurance events like cycling, running, among others. Over on the left of this screen, we see the molecule hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein within red blood cells. There's about 280 million hemoglobin molecules per red blood cell. And this is a globular protein that oxygen and gases, excuse me, oxygen, carbon carbon dioxide bind to for transport. So what we see here is four oxygen molecules, one, two, three, four, bound to the heme group or the iron atom within this protein known as hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide, as I suggested, is transported in red blood cells. It binds to hemoglobin, but it does not bind to the iron atom or the heme group within this protein. Once again, there's about 280 million hemoglobin molecules per red blood cell. And four oxygen atoms can bind to one hemoglobin molecule. So how many total oxygen could potentially be transported by one red blood cell? That's going to be 280 million times four, whatever that number is, quite a large number. Hemoglobin also functions as a pH buffer within the red blood cell, but I will suggest that's really more of an artifact for transport of carbon dioxide throughout the body. I will detail this more in a physiology course, but any increase in the hydrogen ion within a red blood cell is going to be the result of the transport of carbon dioxide. Nonetheless, hemoglobin can act as a buffer for pH by binding the hydrogen ion and preventing any major deviations of pH within the red blood cell. Okay, those are the erythrocytes. We'll talk more about white blood cells and platelets in a later video.